have some specific quality. You have to have uh, this magnetism that, that attracts these other alpha males, these, these killers, these, these creme de la creme of California criminal society. You have to attract them. If you have that magnetism, you have this leadership quality, you have the intellect, you have the heart. Uh, if you're willing to kill, uh, uh, somebody will sponsor Progress you. Progress in the organization uh, by doing work. You do work, and, and work is, is basically stabbing people. Uh, you kill people in the organization, uh, and that's how you escalate. That's how you, uh, that's how you advance. You, it's our status mobility system. In society, you have, uh, you have college, you have your job, you have uh, civil servants. Uh, and that's your status mobility system. I mean, you're edu you educated, you make more money, you move up in, 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 your, in your position in society. In our society, the more people we kill, we advance. The more things we do for the Mexican Mafia, we advance. We gain uh, our social status. We become uh, recognized in the organization. Uh, you first have to capture the uh, attention of uh, a specific Mexican Mafia member. So then you'll, you'll be asked to do favors. I mean, this is a... a, a an organization with audacity, uh, with individuals in it uh, willing to kill, uh, hoping to uh, to shock the public, because this 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 shock and awe value uh, of their crimes uh, generates uh, great publicity for them. I mean, you have to understand that these are domestic terrorists, and they they prey on this uh, constant fear that they evoke uh, by the name Emmet Mexican Mafia. We heard that when we were young. It was like, wow, these guys are heavies. And they are hitters. Ah, that may be accurate for the, the immediate uh, period. I mean, following his arrest, uh, you remove him from uh, that specific neighborhood. But you have to understand that uh, that's when it starts. That's when the individual is going to become a sureño or a norteño. He's going to be placed into his community. Uh, he's going to be placed into a community within prison that, that fosters antisocial behavior. I mean, that thrives on criminal behavior. Uh, and the organization that controls uh, this individual, be it uh, Nuestra Familia, BGF, AB, or M, is going to utilize this individual to infiltrate his neighborhood all over again. Uh, this individual, say he's from Bell Gardens, uh, say he's from Montebello, uh, a Mexican mafia member will contact him and say, who are the connections in your neighborhood? Can you contact them for me? And tell them that you're my representative here and that you want to uh, establish a, a conduit between me and them. And they'll be utilized that way. And we'll, we'll re-infiltrate that, that uh, community and have even a stronger hold than when you took the youngster out. So all you're doing is you're immersing that kid into a world where uh, there's no regression. I mean, he can't go back. Uh, once he's involved with the Mexican Mafia, it's uh, in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, you can't get in and say, I don't want to play no more, unless you drop out like I did. After 20 years of my life, I dropped out. Uh, we use a method of, uh, of communication which I like to call carnival talk. Uh, it sounds innocuous to you and I. But it's nefarious. It's underlying intent. It's nefarious. Say that I had a visitor and I told the visitor, uh, hey, how's uh, Joe doing? Uh, Joe's doing fine. Yeah? Why don't you ask uh, uh, Berta to go over there and see him and uh, make sure she talks to him for me. Uh, give him my very best. Okay. To you, it sounds like uh, Berta's going to go over there and give him regards. But to me, I've just authorized a hit against this individual. Uh, and in any court of law, it can't be proven. Because it sounds so generic. It just sounds generic. I mean, we can talk about money, we can talk about uh, crimes, we can talk about uh, drug collections, extortions, uh, taking cars, pink slips, whatever we want. And uh, we do this all day long. We understand that we're being recorded. And we alter our conversation a bit uh, to sound innocuous. And uh, we have the institutional gang investigators just scratching their heads sometimes. And what does this mean? And what does this mean? Any Mexican Mafia member can authorize a, a hit on anybody, as long as it's not a relative of another Mexican Mafia member or a worker of a Mexican Mafia member. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's become like a phenomenon out of control. Uh, there are lists that are four or five pages long, and they're authorized hard candy, hard check, personal check, you know. And, and this is uh, ridiculous to the, to the hardcore members of the Mexican Mafia because we believe that an assault, once authorized, should be murdered. I mean, it, the individual should be killed because you don't go in to create an enemy. You don't go to assault somebody because it destroys them. I mean, it, their whole resume as a uh, up-and-coming uh, sureño or camarada is, is marred once they're assaulted. So you want to go to whack somebody, I mean, you want to make sure he's killed. So and they use multiple multiple assailants, they use uh, backup shooters, they use bump cars, I mean, they're strategic, strategically done. I mean, some of them are just done where they stick the gun out the window and boom, they do it. 
you know, but some of them, they're well put together. They're well put together. A conservative estimate, there's 150,000 to 175,000 individuals that know the name Mexican Mafia, they fear it, and they will do things for it. Uh, hardcore individuals, say maybe 50,000. Soldados, which are soldiers. Uh, but the group is small, the Mexican Mafia is small in itself. I mean, it has vast influence, vast influence. And that's in California. We're not considering the Arizona, we're not considering the Hawaii faction, we're not considering the federal faction. Uh, this is this is an organization that's truly organized crime. Uh, in our neighborhoods, we're like, how would we equate it? Like senators, we represent those areas. We go to the neighborhood and we treat it like, uh, like demigods. You know, this is a big homie, you know? What do you want, you know? Girls, drugs, money, cars, you got it, you know? We make it uh, profitable for opposition. Uh, all these murders that are committed for nothing over the past years, we have hundreds of bodies stacked up, literally hundreds of victims that have been killed by the Mexican Mafia. We, we parlay that, those past victims, even though they didn't pay then, they pay now. They pay now. People pay us for those murders now because we translate this terrorism into finances. Well, you have a facilitator. This individual is usually a, visit a visitor who uh, handles all your communication to the crew chief. The crew chief is the individual who is your right-hand man. He handles, he's a representative on the streets. And from there, you have crew leaders, uh, individuals who run specific areas for you, parts of your territory. As a member, and then below them, there are workers. Those are the guys that are out there actually collecting and selling drugs and doing the extortions for you and enforcing. As a member, you're, you're, you have an organizational entitlement. Uh, you, as soon as you're made, you inherit a piece of turf. Uh, it's usually the area which you hail from. Say, I'm Boxer from Artesia. Uh, as Boxer from Artesia, I can uh, conduct any illicit activity in Artesia that I wish without any opposition from the organization. I don't have any kickbacks to give anybody. I don't owe anybody any money. This is all cream for me. I can also conduct business in the outlying areas as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with another member's uh, business objectives. If it does, we strike a uh, we strike an agreement. I'll give you X amount of money to let me function here, or you give me X amount of money and you can function here. Uh, everybody pays them up. Everybody pays to do business. We all pay. It's smart business. Um, but I can function anywhere in the state of California, anywhere I wish. Uh, with the full authority of the Mexican Mafia and the full authority of my crew, me being the figurehead of that crew, the ultimate power in that crew, uh, as long as it does not interfere with other members' business. Uh, and if it does, I can easily politic on that member, get him killed, and take over his business. It's that simple. That's all life is in the Mexican Mafia. That's why it's so treacherous. Uh, I used to run quite a large crew, probably one of the most successful crews in Southern California. Uh, and I did all through visits of mail. Uh, we'd alter their names, we'd alter my name when they wrote back, and we conducted business out of Pelican Bay for about 10 years. And I was clearing maybe uh, 60 a year from the cell of Pelican Bay. And that's not bad for being in prison, a thousand miles away from your base of power. That's not bad at all. How much is the crew making? Astronomical amounts. I mean, this, this is, I'm, the low, I'm at the low end of the spectrum being paid. Uh, I understand that I'm the figurehead. They're doing all the work. They own legitimate businesses. Uh, we had two legitimate, three legitimate businesses, uh, and they ran them. But underneath that, they were doing uh, illicit drug trade, extortion. Uh, so if they're driving uh, Mercedes Benzes, Lexuses, uh, Escalades, uh, they're pulling in seven figures easy. I mean, the whole haul of the crew is seven figures easy. Uh, they made far greater amounts of money than me. And, and, but I was satisfied with what I got. I was happy. Although with blue collar money, I, I put my kids to college, I supported my family, and I did well, I think. I know the Mexican Mafia has established ties with La Cosa Nostra and the federal prison system. Although, personally, I never had dealings with them. We had dealings with others, Asians, in Monterey Park. Uh, and we know that they had triads. Uh, we had uh, ties with other organized groups in specific areas, methamphetamine cooks. We had ties with uh, the Arreano Felix clan in uh, Mexico. Uh, Bet. Uh, Marquez had ties. Uh, even some of my crew had ties with some of their lower rung dealers. Uh, there are ties. I mean, anything that makes money is, 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 is what the Mexican Mafia is all about. Anything that increases its political and financial power. And that means dealing with the uh, African community, that's no problem. Uh, all money is green. 
that's what the Mexican mafia thinks. It's uh, that, that money is, is 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 okay. It does okay to do business with anybody as long as it's profitable. When you have Mexican mafia members associating with senators, uh, politicians, uh, well-meaning individuals who believe in what they're doing is right, have no understanding of the uh, nefarious intent of the Mexican mafia. It will it will stoop to an all-time low to get somebody killed. Uh, and that's what these politicians, that, that, that these clergymen, that some of the administrators have to understand. Uh, the Mexican Mafia will kill, and its whole objective is to control. So when you see these peace objectives, uh, these uh, stopping of the drive-bys, this, no, this is just fluff. This is fluff. This is the Mexican Mafia trying to achieve something here, and it's doing it because it looks good. And it pushes law enforcement off a little bit because uh, law enforcement is going to get bad public relations if they go in there and crack up a peace rally, you know. So they're held back, they're held at bay a bit until they understand the true intent of what the Mexican mafia is doing. It's profiting through the stopping of, uh, of drive-bys is what they're doing, infiltrating neighborhoods, creating representatives in each geographic location in Southern California. This is where the big money pays, and this is where we're becoming true organized crime because we can, can control those gangs. We've displayed it that we can. What, Law enforcement, administrations, uh, all the resources the federal government can't do, we can do. We can control gangs. And as quickly as we can say, don't start, don't, don't do drive, but we can stay, start shooting at cops. That's what the Mexican mafia, the power of the Mexican mafia is vast. Some of the Eastern philosophies, some of the warrior philosophies, Sun Tzu's Art of War, Essays on the Ten Arts of War, uh, Carlos Castaneda. Uh, you have just a variety of different literature that, that the Mexican mafia latches on to. I mean, it's considered uh, uh, Prince, uh, the Prince by Machiavelli, uh, political tactics. I mean, we study all these things. I mean, for anybody to think that some of these Mexican mafia members are illiterate, and there are some that are illiterate, don't, 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 don't uh, misconstrue that to think that every Mexican mafia member is a walking genius or anything, because uh, some of them are just as sharp as rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the guys sit back. I mean, we're sitting here doing life, and we have nothing better to do than educate ourselves. So we take college courses. I mean, we read all this classical literature, this Eastern philosophy. And uh, it's absorbed. I mean, we utilize this. We put this to work. In terms of the training, I mean, we all go through uh, basic uh, education as to where to hit people. I mean, where vital organs are, the manner in which we hit them, called shifting gears or over-the-shoulder uh, stabbing motions, which are, are best to sink the knife the deepest. Uh, uh, but there's two areas basically concentrated on. That's the chest area, the mid-torso, uh, and the white lower quadrant of uh, the abdominal area under the ribs, which is liver shot. I mean, this is massive hemorrhage either way, and, and, and that's where we try to hit people when we stab them. Uh, in terms of weapon manufacturing and uh, education and assaults, uh, I mean, this is this is this is almost Disneyland stuff because it's it's we learn this as Sudanians. We come up and this is we know how to make bombs, zip guns, uh, explosives, uh, crossbows, knives. Uh, everything. I mean, we're well schooled and uh, well healed. Uh, you put me in any room, anywhere, I'll come out with a weapon, no matter what. I'll come out with something usable. Yeah, I think that would be considered. Uh, you know, you're throwing, uh, you're shooting daggers at somebody, which is a phrase for you know, uh, staring at them harshly. I think that would be a challenge. That's an immediate challenge. I mean, the individual is going to stop and stare back. I mean, that's that's you're issuing the, the response. You know, you're looking at me, I look at you, uh, and it's somebody's going to wait for the shooting drop. Uh, that's definitely uh, you're gonna you're gonna create a a situation there with for the seasoned veteran, uh, the savvy individual. Uh, he'd approach it respectfully, uh, professionally, in control, always protecting himself, but respectfully. I mean, he wouldn't step on their necks, he wouldn't kick them, beat them, uh, sp uh, speak to them in a derogatory manner, you know. But but he would control the situation. And then once he had it in control, he'd, he'd, he'd speak to them like individuals. I mean, I've spoken with gang cops in the streets before, OSS, uh, individuals like that crash. And uh, once we were done proning out, uh, once they were sure that they had the situation secured, that nobody had any weapons, then they put their guns away and they talked to us. Hey, how you doing? Where you been? Uh, how long were you down? Uh, they, they, they'd try to gain knowledge from you. They'd try to gain intelligence. But they did it in a respectful manner that didn't come off as like they were trying to uh, bleed you for information. One of the policies of the Mexican Mafia has always been uh, never to assault uh, law enforcement. It was, it, was, it was counterproductive. It was always counterproductive. But there's been a swing 
uh, in mentality. I mean, we have younger members coming up with uh, are more violent, more willing to hurt officers. So, I mean, it has to be considered that the, the possibility and the, the true existence of a threat to CDC officials exists and law enforcement because it, that's reality. I mean, the, the game is changing. Uh, Mexican Mafia is losing some of its uh, intimidation factor with CDC, so they're going to have to resort to taking handcuffs numerous times uh, to do assaults in custody. Uh, we had the Buenostro hit in the attorney room, which is a pretty big hit. Uh, me and Benny Peters. Uh, slipped our cuffs, extracted knives from our shoes, and uh, stabbed this guy in front of about 50 cops. Uh, and in Los Angeles County Jail, all they're armed with is a flashlight. Uh, they don't have weapons like PR-24s or uh, OC spray. Or they don't have these things in the county jail. Uh, this is back in 92, uh, uh, before the county jail was fully immersed in, in the depth of what the Mexican Mafia was capable of. Uh, and then fortunately, I had to stand around and they watched it while it occurred because they couldn't stop it. Uh, another time, uh, I stabbed an uh, individual Mexican Mafia member by the name of uh, Henry Carlos in a, in a court tank uh, at CCB. Uh, and the only thing that stopped that was that an officer mentioned having a gun. Uh, and that's what stopped that, that, that hit. I mean, I used to practice uh, in Pelican Bay making cuff keys. You can do it with a bobby pin. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult to open cuffs. I mean, uh, any type of cuff that's designed, uh, we, all we have is time to sit back and figure out how to open it up. Any type of device that you create, uh, other than black boxes. Black boxes are very efficient. Uh, everybody's familiar with the black box? Mm -hmm. uh, they are very efficient. Uh, and that's why everybody hates them in the CDC. They're uncomfortable and they can't be taken off. But if it's regular cuffs, People can take off their cuffs. People do have knives. I had a knife on me for five years straight. In shoe, Pelican Bay. I had a key on me for five years straight. A real key. A real knife. Uh, just, uh, this is the reality in prison. This is what the CDC officers and custodial officers have to understand. Individuals are armed, seriously armed. Uh, and they're willing to commit violence.